We are continuing talking about DC to DC converters. In this video, we're gonna be talking about the boost converter, which is something that we already use for the project. We're kind of backfilling here. So we're gonna go over some analysis similar to kind of what we should have done before the project, but you know, you do what you do, trying to, trying to get stuff done before Thanksgiving. It's, it's what it takes, so. Um, all right, so this is the boost converter topology. If you remember last time we talked about the buck converter, the buck converter basically used a switch to gate an input DC signal to, to sort of turn it on and turn off its connection to the output. And by doing so, by changing the duty cycle, you could change the average value of the input, which passed on to the output, which was a way of reducing the input voltage at the output. And of course it left kind of this chop, so it had to be smoothed up with an LC filter. A boost converter is slightly different, but same basic idea. So both of these ultimately, you can think of a buck converter as taking a, a chopped up signal and running it through an LC filter. You can also think about it as, as storing energy in that inductor while during the transient periods to pass on to the output. So, so you can think of it as energy stored in an, in an inductor, which continues to provide current to the output even after the gate is closed, even after the switch is closed. And that's the idea behind almost all of these converter, these switching converters is they are store, they're using an energy storage element, an inductor, a capacitor, or both. And they're using that to sort of move uh, current from an input to an output in such a way as to change the voltage difference between the input and the output. A buck converter was only capable of reducing the input voltage at the output. A boost converter, on the other hand, is only capable of increasing the input voltage at the output. Now that is an interesting thing to be able to increase an input voltage. And so we're gonna talk about how we do that. So in this case, we have uh, just a drawing of the normal boost converter. You can see here when the switch, oh, I, I do, I, actually, I think I know, I know why I did this, right? So, so when this switch is closed here, when this switch is closed, maybe I should change my color for these slides. All right, when this switch is closed, what happens is you have the supply voltage is now fully dropped across this inductor. And what that does is you apply a voltage across an inductor and what happens? It starts to have, it starts to have an increasing current. And so the voltage across an inductor is equal to L D I D T. So as if you apply a voltage, you just start to get this differential, this change in current through the inductor. And that's storing energy. The energy stored in an inductor is L I squared over two. So as the longer we hold this voltage across the inductor, the more energy is stored in. Of course, there's a limit, right? At a certain, you're gonna eventually sort of hit breakdown. You know, you're not gonna, an inductor can only store so much energy, um, but you know, we don't, we don't push it to its limit in these designs, or at least we shouldn't push it to its limit. But after we've stored some energy in the inductor, what we can do is we can flip the switch open. When we flip the switch open, now what happens is that current that was flowing through this inductor is now going to pass on to our output. And the neat thing about an inductor is the voltage across, or the current through an inductor cannot change instantaneously. So even if this voltage here was something like 10 volts and this voltage here was something like five volts, doing this, charging, charging up current in this inductor and then switching it will mean we are still outputting current to the output. So even if our output voltage is a higher voltage than our input, Using this configuration, sort of charging the inductor by shorting its other terminal and then switching it up or opening the switch so its stored current starts to flow to the output, that is a way to provide energy from a lower voltage side to a higher voltage side. So when the input's a lower voltage than the output, it still will supply output current. And it's important to note that the boost converter cannot pro provide less than the um, input voltage, because think about this. What if we never switch this? What if we never charge this inductor up? We just left this open forever. Then what do we have here? We have V in, we have maybe a little, you know, 0.5 volt drop or something. It's usually a shocky diode. It's usually you know, 0 0.3, 0 0.4 volt drop or so. So basically though, in, in our lowest case scenario here, we're going to have a you know, input voltage minus the voltage drop across the diode. But basically we, don't, we can't do with this circuit what we could do with the buck circuit, which was 
take any fraction of the input and pass it on to the output. Here, we're stuck with the smallest output we can produce is the input voltage, maybe minus a little diode drop. And then, but we, the switching event is what allows us to boost that up. It's what allows us to increase that. And it should also be noted, right? When this thing switches, as soon as this thing switches up, right, as soon as this switches up, we all, we still had the input voltage here. So we still had V in here. And then we have this um, uh, current through the inductor. And what's the voltage across the inductor as soon as we switch? We don't necessarily know. We'd have to do a circuit analysis. It's going to depend on what the voltage here is. But basically, we're going to have, so we could solve this for immediately after the switch what the voltage across the inductor is. But regardless of what that voltage is, the very moment after it switches, the current will be, conti will, will be continuous, right? The current, will, the current right before the switching event will be the same as the current right after the switching event. The difference is if the output voltage is very high, now when this thing switches up, we're going to have a very large voltage across the inductor, which means it's going to, its current is going to drop much faster than it did when it was charging up. So very big output voltage, we're still going to get current to the output, but it's not going to last for very long because this, when it's switched up, when the switch is open, um, we would then in that case see a very large voltage across the inductor, which would very rapidly deplete the energy in that inductor. So let's look at the actual waveforms here. So when, when we're switching, if we, so we have a lot of variables drawn on this diagram here, but when we are, when we're shorted, when we're shorted, that's this phase here. What's happening is, as you can see, we are accumulating current in our inductor. So our inductor is, you know, as we apply a voltage across it, the, the, um, the voltage across the inductor is LDIDT, which means that um, um, yeah, so, so we're going to start to accumulate that. We're starting to have this increasing current flow. Oh, sorry. That's the switch current. What am I talking about? The inductor is going to have this increasing current flow through it. And of course the switch is two. That's what's shown here, right? The switch current in this case is the same because all the current flowing through the inductor is flowing through the switch. And, you know, and that's accumulating energy, right? Again, Energy stored in an inductor. I don't know, whatever. I don't know. Energy stored in inductor W W L. I don't know, whatever you want to call it. But L I squared over two. So that means that the longer so that means also that as this current accumulates, the, the energy stored in the inductor is accumulating at an increasing rate. How is that possible? Well, just think about the input supply. The input supply voltage is constant. As the current increases, v, the, the uh, power is V times I. So yeah, as this current, the higher this current gets to the inductor, the faster the rate of change in energy storage is, is occurring. Now, what happens after we switch? After we switch this? So now, forget about that. So now immediately we have whatever this voltage here was, we have this voltage across the diode, this voltage across the output, and the sum of these two voltages here, the sum of these two voltages is gonna equal the sum of the voltage here, oops, the sum of the voltage here, and the sum of the voltage here. So now basically we're getting a, a, um, a voltage across the, inductor in the other direction that causes the inductor to start to decrease its current starts to decrease and as its current is decreasing the current that flows through the inductor is now flowing through the diode to the output so let's see where is that yeah so right here so the current flowing through the inductor is the current flowing through the diode and what is this the switch current here well obviously when this thing is when this gate is switched open there's no current flowing through the switch. And the switch node voltage. So this is kind of what we were talking about where we get this very, now after we switch, we get this voltage in the other direction across the inductor. So as soon as this, I'm making a complete mess here. As soon as this switch opens up, as soon as the switch opens up, the voltage here is gonna equal this voltage here plus the diode drop. So previously this node was shorted so we saw it shorted. And then after the switch opens up, now 
this you start to get current flow through this diode here and your the switch node is now seeing that full voltage that full output voltage plus the diode drop and that causes again right that causes this inductor current to drop and then when the switch closes again we once again we start storing up energy in the inductor again so it's store up energy in the inductor switch it dump that energy to the output go back to storing energy in the inductor switch it dump that uh, dump that energy back to the output. And um, the nice thing about this is, again, this functions with any output voltage. So it doesn't matter what the, this output voltage could be a million volts. And at least on paper, you know, we'll talk later on about why that doesn't always work. But at least on paper, for a very short period of time, you would get, um, you would get current flow from the input. To the, even if the input was one volt and the output was a million volts, technically, theoretically, you would still get current flow to the output doing this. Now, of course, you know, again, we'll, we'll talk, but it should be noted, everything we've been talking about here is under what is called continuous conduction mode. So continuous conduction mode is when the current through the inductor is always greater than zero. So you see this, the, you know, the, the current through the inductor never dies. So the inductor current never drops to zero in this case. So that's important to note. That's a that's a big distinction in operational phases for buck and boost converter. We didn't talk about this with a buck converter, but a buck converter can do this too, where it's possible for a buck converter to drop out of continuous conduction. It's possible for the inductor to fully to to fully die to have its to have its current drop to zero. So, uh, and we, again, we will talk about that. So. An interesting thing about the boost converter is the ratio output voltage to input voltage is given by one divided by one minus the duty cycle. So as our duty cycle, as D approaches one, so as our duty cycle approaches 100%, this ratio approaches infinity. And again, there's a limit to how much you can actually boost these things. It's, a lot of students get really excited when we talk about boost converters because they, they see, oh man, I can take a battery and I can make a million volts. And you know, you, you, you kind of can, you, have, you know, uh, you gotta be careful. That's how stun guns work out. If you're stun, you know, stun guns basically just store energy in an inductor and then switch it and they switch the, you know, this output if you didn't have a resistor here and you just had two terminals, which is a little prongy parts of a stun gun, then when this thing switches, guess what? You're gonna have current flow no matter what. So you're gonna have current flow through here. And even if you have to have, you know, a big giant lightning, that's not a lightning strike. I, I can't draw a lightning bolt. Even if you have to have, that's a pretty good lightning bolt. <laughs> even if you have to have a spark discharge between those terminals and it has to produce, 50,000 volts or so, it'll do it. And so that's that's what stun guns do. So YouTube's probably gonna flag this now because I talked about stun guns, but I talked about it academically. This is not, we're not building them. We're not, I'm just giving this principle that the current through an inductor cannot change instantaneously. You know, that has a lot of implications and the stun guns are one of them. <laughs> stun guns are an interesting one of them. Anyway. Um, okay, so yeah, so as this duty cycle approaches 100%, the ratio of output to input approaches infinity. And it should also be, no, right? What, is a, what does a 99% duty cycle mean? It means that it charges this inductor. 99% of the time, we are accumulating current in the inductor. 1% of the time, we are uh, transferring that current, transferring that stored energy from the inductor to the output. So when we have these very high ratios, Right? We're, we're only transferring energy to the output for a very short period of time. But if the output voltage is that high, again, the change in current through an inductor is proportional to the voltage across it. So if we have a small voltage at the input for a very long time charging up the inductor, all of that stored energy will be canceled out by a very massive voltage for a very short time at the output when we switch this thing. So. Now, discontinuous conduction. It's really important to talk about this especially for boost converters, because these have this happens all the time. We had, we had talked about how continuous conduction, the current through the inductor never drops to zero. But one thing to note with these sorts of boost converters is what does the output at all dictate the 
the current accumulation in the inductor when we have it shorted? No. Right? Going back here, you know, this circuit with the switch flipped, this circuit, which is going to dictate how much current we build up in the inductor, that has nothing to do with the output. You know, us charging this inductor has nothing to do with the output. So, so we, you know, each time we switch this, we might store five joules of energy in the inductor, you know, whatever, not probably not that much for, for, for the types of ones we deal with, but, but, you know, we're going to be storing energy in this inductor and the amount of energy we store is not a function of the output. So the question is, what happens as our output doesn't really consume that much energy? Well, as our output doesn't consume very much energy, you know, what will happen is this will start to drop right? as our, so as our output, um, as the energy that is consumed by our output goes down, this average current is going to drop until this waveform gets so, you know, the average current here is going to be proportional to the average current of the output minus that sort of that uh, uh, ratio factor. So if the output current is really tiny, eventually this waveform is gonna drop until it wants to do this, right? So it wants to do this such that the average value here is very low. So the average value of the current is very tiny. The problem is it can't do this. We can't have these negative peaks here. Why not? Because this diode prevents it. So that diode prevents us from ever having energy flow back to our input, which means that because our, our current ripple through our inductor is just set by our duty cycle, it's not set by the output load at all. In order for this converter, to drive very low output energy or very low output currents, um, it's gonna it's gonna bump into an issue. It's gonna bump into this situation where it tries to go negative and it can't. That's called that's discontinuous conduction. Discontinuous conduction is this case where the inductor dies, where the where the where, so where the circuit wants to to maintain the proper output voltage. The circuit wants to go negative. It wants to have its current go negative and it can't. And so again, going back to this equation, this equation is not valid if we have discontinuous conduction. This equation is only valid for continuous conduction. And you can think about that, right? Take it to the extreme. What if we had, what if we had no, no output load at all? What if we had just an open circuit? Would this voltage ratio hold? Well, of course not. If we had an open circuit at the output, we would just, each time we switched, we would just be adding more charge to an output capacitor. And indefinitely, right? If we had no output load, every time we switched, we'd just be taking all the stored energy in the inductor and putting it to this output capacitor. So it would just, it would just, the voltage would just increase forever in that, you know, again, in the ideal mathematical, in, in the realm of, you know, in physics class where you had the infinite line of charge, you know, imagine there's an infinite sheet of charge uh, in that kind of imaginary realm where everything is perfect and everything's ideal. Of course, it's not going to hold under discontinuous, con or, or, or under uh, discontinuous conduction. So this equation only valid for continuous conduction. Here's what happens in discontinuous conduction. So again, the issue here is the uh, inductor discharges and then it wants to go negative to maintain the proper average output current, but it can't. When I say it wants to go negative, right? it's not that it, I'm, not, I'm trying not to anthropomorphize this too much, anthropomorphize, anthropomorphize, anth whatever. I'm not, I'm not trying to, I'm not a linguist. I'm not trying to, to say it's, it, it needs to, to maintain this, to maintain this proper ratio, it needs to be able to go negative and it can't because of the diode as we already talked about. So what happens is, a couple things to note. One, that switch voltage. So we said that when, when, the, when the boost converter switches, that switch node sees the output voltage, right? The diode is conducting, so the switch node sees the output voltage. That is true until we get to the point where there's no voltage drop across, there's no forward current, in which case the diode's not conducting anymore, in which case that node is not going to see the output voltage. So so once this circuit, once the current here drops to zero, now this diode is turned off. And now we're gonna have V out here and we're just gonna have VS here. 
So, so once, if there's no current flow through the inductor, this is going to be VS, which is weird because before it was, it was either zero when we had it shorted, when we, when we were charging up the inductor, or it was the output voltage plus some diode drop when we had it, when we had it open circuited. But now we're saying in this discontinuous case, when the current drops to zero, now it's seeing this, it's seeing the input voltage at this switch node. So it's seeing the input voltage at the switch node. And we also have this, you know, the, obviously the inductor current drops to zero. We see the rectifier current drops to zero. So basically this is a period of time where the circuit is doing nothing. So the circuit, but you gotta be careful, right? The circuit's doing nothing, meaning it's not providing energy to the output, but it's also not drawing energy away from the output. So this is the problem is in discontinuous conduction is you can get an output voltage that is unregulated, that runs away from you. And how is this, how do we actually deal with this? So this is a, something that happens, this is very common, of course, if you think about it, right? If you power something with a, let's say you have a circuit powered by a boost converter, is it always going to be drawing its maximum current? No. You know, well, in, in the circuit that we did, we had a sharp sensor that consumed like 30 milliamps when it was charging up and close to zero milliamps when it wasn't operating. So our, what was our boost converter doing? It was seeing you know, a 30 milliamp load and then it was seeing basically a zero milliamp load. So while that boost converter is seeing the zero milliamp load, most likely it's undergoing discontinuous conduction. And how do we deal with that? Because as we said, discontinuous conduction, if you're not careful, the duty cycle equation doesn't mean anything. So you're, how do we keep our output voltage what it needs to be? That's where we always with these switching regulators have a controller. So if you have a controller that is monitoring the output voltage, what it will do is, yeah, in continuous conduction, the output to input voltage ratio should be this nice clean one divided by one minus the duty cycle, maybe plus a little fudge factor of efficiency. But if we if that if, if that's no longer the case, we have discontinuous conduction, we have to have a control circuit that's monitoring the output voltage. And when it sees the output voltage going too high, presumably because of something like discontinuous conduction, it reduces the duty cycle as necessary. So it'll scale back the duty cycle. And that's pretty much any boost converter that you see, any boost converter controller, all-in-one boost converter, almost all of these can handle the discontinuous conduction case. There are some older, especially older high energy circuits that can't. So some older ones just operate on a constant non-regulated duty cycle. And those ones, they have to be a little more careful. And usually in those cases, they just, sometimes with those old systems, they just have a separate circuit that will just burn power to have it operate correctly. So it's kind of an interesting thing, but, but I wanted you to see this also, it should be noted the critical duty cycle, the critical duty cycle at which um, we start to hit at where we transition from continuous to discontinuous conduction is given by two times the inductance divided by R uh, times the period of switching, which is the inverse of the switching frequency. So we can also put that on top if we want. Now, this is interesting. So as our resistance goes up, our critical duty cycle goes down. Well, what does that mean? Yeah, but of course that makes sense because what does the resistance going up mean? A resistance going up means our output load is consuming less power. So our average, our, as our output resistance goes up, our output current on average is going to drop. And if it's, if it's down into that point where the output current is less than the average switch, is less than the average inductor current, yeah, we're going to hit discontinuous conduction and the thing is going to switch into discontinuous operation mode. So let's design this stuff. You know, we can talk theoretically about it. And I also want to be very clear, we are doing a very light touch on a boost converter. The boost, con we could teach an entire class on the boost converter, on analyzing the boost converter. We have an energy course that goes over these in more detail. But as I said, in the case of the buck converter, a proper, uh, a proper analysis of these sorts of circuits is, is a very complicated thing because a proper analysis has to take into account several non-ideal things, including a non-ideal switch. So the MOSFET we use to do this switching has the on phase, the off phase. It also has the transitioning on off and that transition time and things like that. And so, so an actual proper analysis is very complicated. What we're doing right now is fairly simple. But this kind of gives you a bit of a, you know how to use it. I want you to be able to use a boost circuit to design uh, a system that incorporates a boost circuit that functions correctly. 
So to do that part of it, let's let's look at what TI says. So I'm going to go again. Last time we did the buck converter, I said, hey, let's look at this TI white paper or this TI application report. Same thing here for the boost converter. Let's go back to that application report. The reason I like these application reports is because one, they're free. So you don't have to pay for them like a textbook. Two, when you leave college, your textbook is going to start to become less and less useful with each year that goes by. But if you go look at these application reports from these big companies, usually they stay fairly relevant. If you look for modern ones, and what that means to stay relevant is as the technology underlying these, these systems or these tools change, the application reports that say, here's how to use these things will change. Because they might say, hey, somebody invents a new type of diode and it works great, but it's got this one really weird feature. Well, it'll probably be in the newest application report and it probably won't be in your textbook from 20 years ago or 30 years ago or whatever. So, so I like to, for several reasons, I like to teach from, from these external resources. I like you to be able to use them and read them and understand them. Uh, this, both of the, the Buck, uh, TI Buck application report and the TI Boost one are both posted on the Canvas page for the class. But again, just like in the last video, I'm gonna go through the key equations here in the slides. So if you don't wanna look at it, it's good. the key equations are gonna be here. And I'm gonna break down the pieces of what, it wasn't clear in the last video exactly, you know, I just kind of tossed a bunch of equations up. But TI steps you through a three-step process. The first step is make sure the converter, like the actual converter controller you're working with is gonna work for your application. So that's the first thing. You wanna make sure you're using a converter that can handle the current that you need. You wanna make sure you're using a, a converter that can handle the input voltage, the output voltage that can handle, um, you know, they can, they can, that will work. So, so it's one thing. So you have to, you have to first of all know that your switching controller or switching circuit. A con the difference is a controller typically doesn't include the MOSFETs that do the switching, whereas an actual converter would internally include those MOSFETs. So you have to make sure it's just going to work for your application at all. And then once you know it's probably going to work, then you go into the details of okay, let's pick an actual value for this. So that the first couple of equations I showed last time, I sort of said. Yeah, these are used to derive this stuff later on, but the reason TI presents them early is it's a way of saying, am I even in the bright ballpark? Is this converter that I've chosen even something moderately close to what I need to do what I need it to do? So step one, find if your boost converter will work for you by approximating the average input current and ripple. Check the data sheet for candidate inductor value. So, so if, you, if you're saying, I like this boost converter, I'd like to use it, look in the data sheet, See what inductor values they have for it. See what switching uh, frequency it uses. See see what its maximum gate current is. See what its average gate current is. You know all these are if, if it has the you know the, the MOSFETs internal. These are all going to be important for determining is this actually going to work for you. Step two. Once you know, yep, I think this circuit's going to work. I think this this I'm going to be able to buy this product and use this product. Step two is find what inductor value you need to get your desired inductor ripple. And desired inductor, you know, there's not always a desired inductor ripple, but usually if your inductor ripple is too small, that means you're wasting a lot of money on an inductor. If the inductor ripple is too tiny, you're prob you probably paid for way too much inductor than you had to. But if your inductor ripple is too big, now you're going to run into a situation where possibly, you know, you're going to get discontinuous conduction at peak current draw, which is really bad. Um, or... Or, or, or you're just gonna produce a ton of noise or it's just gonna, you know, I don't know, just, you know, you, there's, there's a limit. You don't want the ripple to be too small. You don't want it to be too big. We usually ballpark it around 20 to 40% of the average current. And that's what, that's kind of the example they gave. And that's usually fairly safe. What if your ripple was like 100% of your average current? Well, that means that right off the bat, you're discontinuous. So even in your peak current draw case, you're in discontinuous operation. That's really, that's really bad. You definitely don't want to do that. So, so we want to stay away from that. So, you know, that 30% ballpark is good. And then three, calculate the capacitor value. So once you've chosen the inductor, that's going to get you the ripple that's in the ballpark of what you need based on that ripple, based on that inductor. Now you're going to go back and you're going to calculate uh, what you're going to calculate what capacitance is needed at the output to smooth this thing out to a desired ripple voltage. Okay, so TI's guidance. Step one, find if your boost converter will work. TI kind of gives you these rough cut equations. We, um, so this is, a, this is a rewriting of the equation we showed earlier, which was, uh, which was that um, the ratio of output to input voltage is going to be the 
uh, one over one minus the duty cycle. Um, and this is just redoing it. And it's also adding this fudge factor, this efficiency factor. Boost converters are typically not as efficient as buck converters, but they're still pretty good. So it's very reasonable to assume 75 to 85% efficiency for a worst case scenario for a boost converter. That's a very, you know, modern boost converters, that's very, very reasonable to expect. It varies, it depends on a lot of things. But again, look at the data sheet, look at the curves, try to estimate where you're gonna be operating in on those curves, get a ballpark efficiency, you can use it in this equation. Once you have the duty cycle, you can calculate um, the average, the delta IL. Uh, and this is now, this is again, this is, a, this is a putting the cart before the, ho the horse. So TI just sort of says, look at the data sheet, pick kind of a, you know, the data sheet should have a range of inductor values that work well with the converter. Pick one in the middle. You're, you're, you're sort of assuming it's all going to work, assuming it's all going to work. What is my current ripple going to be? And then you can say to yourself, okay, is this current ripple, is this change in current through my inductor within the ballpark of what I'm looking for? So if you see, okay, um, based on this duty cycle and the inductance that, that is recommended to use with this boost converter, um, based on that, my delta IL is 100 milliamps, but, um, but I need to have a, an output current of, of three amps. Well, that's probably not gonna work too great, right? That's probably, you're probably gonna have issues there. So, um, okay, and then, so we can calculate the max output here too, if we wanna just, so I shouldn't have, I shouldn't have said what I just said, because the equation, this does a much better job. So for the equation here, you can say, based on the limit, this, so this, this I limit min, this is the limit, this is the, um, <laughs> the minimum maximum current flowing through the gates in the boost converter. So this is basically, you shouldn't ever push the design to, to more than this current through the switches internal to the boost converter. So this is, the, this is the limit of the hardware. That minus this current ripple divided by two times this one minus the duty cycle, that's gonna tell you what the maximum output current is going to be for this boost converter. And this is gonna tell you, does this work for me? So this is gonna say, hey, I needed three amps of output current. And when I calculated this, I got 200 milliamps. So no, you're not even in, you're not in the right zip code. You need to go back and you need to look through DigiKey and you need to look through designs and find a better boost converter, switch to that one and go through this process again. So this is, so this is all the horse trading you do before you've set, when you have to settle on a boost converter that you kind of know is gonna work for you before you do this analysis. Cause it is that boost converter that's gonna tell you what's your maximum current through your switches, what's your switching frequency, stuff like that. So, and that's all stuff you need for these equations. Um, okay. So assuming we know, now normally it's just gonna be given to you. If, if I give you a problem, it's usually gonna be, well, assuming you're using this boost converter, pick a value. And you might find in doing the pick a value that like things are way off and, and then you, you, you know it's not quite right for you. but Step two, calculate the inductor value uh, needed based on approximate desired inductor ripple. So once again, we kind of do just like we did in the buck converter, you know, 20 to 30% of your maximum output current is a good, oh, 20 to 30% of your maximum output current times this ratio V out over V in. So again, we, had, we're, we are um, a, a boosted output voltage means we're gonna need much more current at the input than we have at the output. So if we're basing our needs on our output current, which is usually the way we got it, you know, if you if you are boosting five volts to ten volts, and you need one amp at the output, you're gonna need you're gonna have at least two amps at the input. You know, because you, you don't just get energy for free, right? It's always gonna be v times the power is gonna be v times i. So power is v times i at both the input and the output. So if the v is high on the output, the i has got to be high on the input. And this will give you your delta i l once you have that. You can plug that in, find your inductor value. The good thing is this is just plug and chug. This is just entering numbers into an, into an equation. Again, switching frequency is going to be a function of the actual boost converter you've chosen for your design. V out and V in based on your design needs. So that's it. That's, you can calculate your inductor size that you need using this. And then lastly, we calculate the capacitor, the output capacitor. So we say in, for the, in the case of the boost converter, the output capacitor is gonna be the maximum output current, which is again, specified by our application needs. 
times the duty cycle, which we calculated that here. Right? Uh, divided by the switching frequency, parameter of the boost converter that we're using, times the ripple. Now, the ripple is, this is something we specify. So we're saying, how big of a capacitor do I need to get a ripple that is this small? So this is gonna be something, we get to pick this. Delta V out is what we want for our design. Or it's, and usually it's something where it's not necessarily just you get to pick it. A lot of times you're using an integrated circuit and the integrated circuit says, this circuit needs a power supply of five volts with a maximum ripple of 100 millivolts peak to peak. In that case, the maximum you got is given by that, that, that sort of downstream piece of technology that's gonna be using this supply voltage. Let's do an example. So let's jump right into an example. So we're building a circuit that takes 3.7 volt input voltage from a lithium polymer battery and produces an output voltage of five volts. Sound familiar? Assume the boost converter has a switching frequency of 700 kilohertz, operates at 80% efficiency and has a maximum output current of 50 milliamps. Your design should have an output voltage ripple of 50 millivolts. Okay, so we're gonna skip the first part of TI's design. We're gonna go through the, the step, the process that, that has been shown here. We're gonna skip the first part because there are, our converter was given to us. It's not, is this the right converter for the problem? We weren't given a choice. We were just told, here's your switching frequency. So we have to assume that in whatever thing this is, these input switches, these, in, these gates can handle the current, whatever it needs to be for this particular application. But if our output current is only 50 milliamps, you know, it's probably gonna be okay. So, so let's go back to that equation here. So our inductor value is gonna be V in times V out minus V in. Uh, divided by delta IL times switching frequency times V out. Okay, plug things in. Our VN is 3.7 times V out minus VN is going to be five minus 0.7. Divided by delta IL. Uh, so what's our delta IL gonna be? Well, we say we have an output current of 50 milliamps. So let's go back here. Oops. So, so let's use 0.3. We'll say a ripple of 0.3, it's somewhere in the middle. It's, I should have probably given it. So. Point three times our output current, which is 50 milliamps, times this ratio of output voltage divided by input voltage. So that's gonna be... All right, let's start plugging numbers in here. Get the old trusty, trusty HP here. So we have... Uh, So I get um, 20 point, wait, yeah, 20 point two seven milliamps. So it's gonna be 0 0.0207 times our switching frequency was 700 kilohertz, times V out, which is five. So all of this equals 67, 67.8 microhenries. Yep, 67.8 microhenries. 
Okay, so we found our inductor value. Now we got to go back and find our capacitor value. So this is going to be I out max times D. So let's calculate D, our duty cycle here. So the duty cycle is going to be one minus V in min times our efficiency divided by V out. So our V in min, our efficiency was 80% divided by V out. Okay. So I get a duty cycle of 0 0.408 here. So then going back to this expression, we have C out equals I out max times D. So that's 0 0.05 times the duty cycle here, which is um, 0.408. Eight divided by frequency switching, 700 kilohertz. My memory is not great today. Yeah. Everything's going wrong. Times delta V out. So that was our ripple, which we said was 50 millivolts. actually really nice. <laughs> so and I get um, Five hundred eighty-two point eight six nanofarads in this case. So there's a couple things that might be surprising about this, and one thing that might be surprising is that's a fairly big inductance. So this is a, something that's a little weird here: is that we need a big inductance as as our current ripple gets smaller. We need a bigger inductor. Well, that kind of makes sense, right? I mean, you know, you're you know, big inductor is going to reduce your current ripple because it's, you know, a big inductor, it, its current changes slower. But, but our delta IL was low because we weren't drawing a lot of current at the output, right? We, we weren't drawing a lot of current, so 0.3% of our current is fairly small. So this is something that's a little puzzling about boost converters, that we need a bigger inductor even though our output current is tinier. Hmm, that's weird. But here's the dish, here's the issue. Yes, you need a bigger inductor because your output current's small because when you when you have these switching events, right? Again, you're applying a full full input voltage across your inductor for 40% of the time here. So if you don't want too much current to accumulate in that, you have to have a big inductor. But here's the trade-off. When we have a small output current, we can use an inductor that's rated to a very small current. So if you get a 100 microhenry inductor, Ooh, that's a big inductor, but not if it's only rated to 200 milliamps. 200 milliamp rated 100 microhenry inductor is very small. It's very inexpensive. The flip side is, you know, a 10 microhenry inductor, if it's rated to three amps, that could be an issue. You could have a problem. This is actually the crux of, I think, what happened with some of our lab boards. I think probably for our board design for our project, we should have used, instead of using... 4.7 microhenry inductors that are rated for three amps, we probably should have used something bigger that was rated for a smaller current. So that was on me. I didn't actually, I was using, I was pulling a reference design from one I'd used previously, and I wasn't considering the, the different uh, the different case requirements for this. So, you know, something, something to consider. Another thing to consider though, is most boost converters are intelligent in the sense that most of them now, if they have this problem of they are, 
drawing too much power while operating, or their, sorry, their output is not consuming very much power, usually there's several things they can do to fix that. They, they can usually, one, they can go into operating in discontinuous mode, but most modern ones can actually change their switching frequency as well. So they can change their switching frequency to operate a little bit more efficiency, efficiently in addition to changing their duty cycle of operation. So, um, okay. So for, before this analysis, we found less than one microfarad for this. And again, that's just because it's a small output current. So it does, does not need a lot of capacitance to the output. It does want a fairly inductive inductor though for this. So. Learning, learning as we go along here, designing boost converters. Now, I'm gonna go back because those equations that we just did looked very similar to the equations we did in the last video where we were talking about the buck converter, but they are not the same. The buck converter calculation for the output capacitor was this. The buck, the capacitor output for the boost converter is given by this. So very different, typically, boost converters are much more noisy than buck converters. So, so typically with, a, and I, I mean, again, it varies based on how much you're boosting, but usually uh, it, it, you often need very large output capacitors to smooth out a boosted signal, even if it's not much current output. So, I mean, going back to this, if we had had an amp of current, if we had had you know, 20 times this, um, we would have had our, We would have had this value would have been increased by a factor of 20. This would have been closer to 10 microfarads. So this would have been a much bigger capacitance if we had had sort of something closer to a more sort of normal boosted, boosted uh, voltage value. And the other thing is capacitors matter. So not all capacitors are made the same. I think we'll talk about that a little bit later on here, but yeah, we'll jump right into it. So as we talked about earlier, Everybody gets excited when they see a boost converter equation and they say, wow, I can, I can make my duty cycle 99.9% .9 and I can boost a one volt input to a thousand volts or something, you know, something like that, right? They, I'm not sure my math is right on that, but, but you know, you get this idea that, wow, there's no limit to that equation. That equation, we can, we can change that duty cycle to basically be one divided by zero. We can produce an infinite voltage, right? We can do it. We can, we can make everybody's hair stand up in the entire city or something. I don't know, some sort of something crazy like that. But of course there's a limit. So the, typically what the, the breakdown limit you'll hit for a boost converter is in the components that you're using. So if we go back to where we have an actual boost circuit, typically one thing is this diode here has to block. So if your output here is a thousand volts and your input here was five volts, well, guess what? That's going to be well, actually, it doesn't matter what your input here is. This, when it's switched down, this is going to be zero. This is going to be a thousand. This diode has to block a thousand volts across the terminal. So, di typically, the diodes will break it, but you can get diodes that block thousands of volts. They usually have a very high forward voltage, but you can get diodes that block thousands of volts. Then the other issue you have is this MOSFET. So remember, when this first switches, the MOSFET is seeing the full output voltage. So the MOSFET is seeing the full voltage at the output of the circuit across its terminals. That means you need a MOSFET that can handle thousands of volts or whatever you're boosting to. That's also an issue, but you can buy MOSFETs that can withstand thousands of volts. They just typically have a lot of issues, right? I mean, they have, there's a trade-off, right? You don't get anything for free, but it's doable. So. So yes, we can use boost converters to produce very large output voltages if we design them carefully. But even when we design them carefully, we are still going to run into issues with resistance. So this is pulled from a, another TI design report that's talking about this sort of when you know boost converters sort of hit a, a duty cycle limit where beyond this duty cycle, they become extremely inefficient. Beyond this duty cycle, they start to not operate correctly. And one thing they point out is that the resistances of the MOSFET and the res resistances of the synchronous MOSFET, and this is referring to in these designs in both the buck and the boost converter, we can, we can replace this diode. Diodes we don't like. They have a 0.7 volt or 0.5 or 0.3 volt drop across their terminals. They burn power. What if we replace that with a MOSFET? And, 
And we just have it be a MOSFET that we turn on and turn off at just the right moment. We can do that and make it a little more efficient. That's called a synchronous regulator. So I probably should have talked about it before I got to this slide, but basically, so you can do this. This could be the resistance of the synchronous MOSFET or the resistance of the diode. I mean, it works either way. It's the same basic idea here. But these resistances and the resistance of the inductor, all of these resistances as well will sort of set a limit on your maximum duty cycle. Where beyond this duty cycle, you're, you're actually not going to be achieving actual gain. You're going to, all of your power is going to be going, all of your energy is going to be going to, to heat in these, um, in these switches and these inductors rather than actually being producing useful energy at the output of your circuit. So I hate to burst your bubble, but you can't, it's not very easy to make a million volt uh, boost converter because of these limitations. So it's something, something to keep in mind, something to know, something to know is out there. All right, that is it for today. We are done. The black slide tells me we are done talking about boost converters. We will add some extra little details as we go along. So we're going to add some, you know, things like synchronous operation. In the next video, we are going to talk a, a, very briefly, we're going to talk about two other types of configuration of DC to DC switching converters. And then we're going to jump into battery chargers. Battery chargers are a technology that has gotten more important as time has gone on. Now, it's almost cheaper now to put a rechargeable lithium polymer battery in a design than to have a single alkaline battery. So there's there's been these weird sorts of, of things that have happened in recent years that make battery charging circuits really important. Again, that was something we used in the project. We're going to go into that in the next lecture after we talk about um, after we talk about the um, uh, two different two different additional switching topologies. So thank you for watching.